knew ever since the end of the Pentateuch that Joshua was going to be taking over for Moses. We knew this from uh, everywhere. Uh, everyone agreed. Uh, here's the priestly text, right? Joshua uh, had his hands laid on him and was filled with the spirit of uh, wisdom, and the Israelites start uh, listening to him. Uh, we know it from E, where, the, uh, where Joshua is called into the tent of meeting. Uh, we know it from D, same sort of thing, be strong and resolute. You are the one who's going to go in. Uh, that's P and E and D. I should mention J doesn't have this transfer of power because Joshua doesn't exist in J's Pentateuch story, at the very least. Uh, so in any case, we knew that uh, Joshua was going to lead the Israelites after Moses. What we didn't know was how closely Joshua's career would mirror that of, Mil of Moses. Right? We, we knew that he's going to be just as much of a leader Right? Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. But obviously a different kind of leader. Not uh, prophetic, not a teacher of law. Right? Moses is the only lawgiver uh, that Israel ever knows. Uh, but a, a warrior. Uh, and this is something we saw already all the way back in, in Exodus uh, 17, uh, where Moses is sort of standing, right? Moses is standing there holding his hands up and Joshua is out there uh, fighting. Uh, and yet, for all of the differences in their, in their roles, uh, Joshua uh, has a little bit of Moses in him. Um, uh, Joshua's first act as Israel's leader is reminiscent of Moses. Uh, right? Go through the camp and get, tell the people, get ready for in three days' time you're going to cross the Jordan. That's pretty similar to what happens at Sinai. The three days' time, get everyone get ready. Uh, Joshua, of course, sends spies just as Moses did. Joshua has the people purify themselves, just as Moses did. We have the Israelites crossing the Jordan on miraculous dry land under Joshua, which ought to be familiar from movies, if not from texts. When they've crossed, the Israelites set up 12 stones as a symbol of their crossing, uh, which is perhaps similar to the stones of uh, the Decalogue, uh, which were also, of course, a symbol of a, of a sort of revelation, a mir miraculous divine event. Uh, and, of course, just as the revelation in Exodus, as we talked about, was intended to prove Moses' authority, so too uh, this uh, in Joshua on that day, uh, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel so that they revered him as they had revered Moses. But these, uh, these stones in the Jordan may also be uh, similar to the stones of the priest's ritual outfit, uh, which are reminders to God of the Israelite people. In fact, we could note the stated purpose of these stones that Joshua sets up uh, as a symbol, so that when your children ask, what is this about?, um, uh, this, is pretty, this is pretty familiar uh, language from, say, the Passover. Right? When your children ask you, what do you uh, here's what you will tell them. The connection of these stones in the Jordan with the Exodus is made explicit. Right? The Lord dried up the waters of the Jordan just as the Lord your God did to the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea, uh, which he dried up uh, before us until we crossed. So these 12 stones, whatever you want to make of them, have lots of resonances with Moses and Moses' actions. Uh, the Israelites under Joshua offered the Passover sacrifice, just as they did at the beginning of uh, the Exodus, naturally enough. Right? And they do it just at the right time, right? the 14th day uh, toward evening. Uh, this moment, of course, the offering of the Passover sacrifice in the Promised Land marks the end of the Exodus, right? The end of the journey from Egypt to Canaan. Uh, and we see that on the day after the Passover offering, they ate the produce of the country. And as soon as they start eating the produce of the Promised Land, manna stops showing up for them. Right? Just as manna marked the beginning of their wandering, so too 
mana marks, the, the absence of mana marks the end, uh, the conclusion of the wilderness wandering uh, from all the way back in Exodus 16, right after the crossing of the sea when the mana first shows up. Joshua runs into an angel, a divine messenger, in a moment that is awfully familiar uh, to uh, Moses' own moment of running into a divine being or messenger or God. Uh, when Joshua conquers the city of Ai, uh, it looks a little bit similar. Hold out your hands or hold out your javelin in your hand, your spear. And the holding out of the hand is what permits the people to Israel to be victorious, just as was the case uh, in Exodus 17, when it was Moses who was holding out his hand. And of course, in some cases, it's just Joshua fulfilling Moses' instructions quite accurately, right? Uh, he builds the altar on Mount Abal that was uh, instructed to be built back in Deuteronomy 27. He builds the altar, he offers sacrifices, he writes the words of the Torah on the stones that he sets up there. The Israelites, as instructed, stand and yell blessings and curses at each other from the two mountaintops. Uh, and as the text tells us, uh, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua failed to read in the presence of the entire assembly of Israel, including the women and the children, in case you thought they were included in the, in the assembly of Israel, it turns out, uh, uh, and the strangers uh, who accompanied them. In one respect, at least, Joshua out Moses's Moses. Right? Uh, Joshua uh, is the one who gets the Lord to, st to get the sun to stand still. Uh, neither before nor since has there ever been such a day when the Lord acted on words spoken by man. As you know, the book of Joshua is full of battles and exterminations and conquests and wars, and all of that is represented to us as the fulfillment of Moses' words. Right? Just as the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, so Moses had charged Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone. And near the end of Joshua's life, he gives two speeches. And the first one in Joshua 23 is like a, this tour de force of, of rhetoric and sounds very much like the kind of thing Moses would say. You have seen all that the Lord has done to all those nations on your account. For it was the Lord your God who fought for you. If it were Moses, it would have been, you have seen how God took us out of Egypt and led you through the wilderness right, and, and preserved you to this day. But that notion of, right, you've seen the thing, so you should, you should know and understand. Be careful to observe the laws that Moses gave you, right, without deviating to the right or to the left, which was the line directly out of Deuteronomy. Right? Especially the laws about intermingling with those pesky Canaanites, Obviously, something else that Moses was super obsessive about. Joshua goes on, if you should turn away and disobey and intermarry and joining, right? terrible things are going to happen to you. You will be punished harshly. Right? Truly, this, if, this, if I had changed the title of this slide and put it in Deuteronomy somewhere, you'd never know right? if I made this Moses talking. And Joshua says in a way just like Moses did. I'm gonna die now. God has done all these great things for you, but God can do bad things to you too. Again, all of this is pretty much a good summary of the last chapters of Deuteronomy. It's Moses, it's, see, it's Joshua just picking up all of Moses' language and all of Moses' messaging for the next generation. And having done that, in Joshua 24, we get yet another farewell speech because uh, maybe, uh, maybe, I don't know, Moses gets two of them. Why shouldn't Joshua? Uh, and this one begins with a historical summary. 
not unlike what we see in Deuteronomy uh, 26 or in Deuteronomy 1 through 3 for that matter, right? In olden times, I don't remember what translation I used for that, but in olden times is great and, and definitely what the Bible says. Um, uh, in olden times, uh, yeah, your forefathers, right? And so going back with this little histor history lesson, as it were, and Joshua in this speech gives the people a choice Revere the Lord and serve, or if you are loath to serve, choose which gods you are going to serve. This is one of my favorite verses, really, in the entire book of Joshua. And they're like, you know, you should serve, you should, you should revere the Lord and serve him. Uh, but if, if not, choose whoever you're going to choose. Right? Good luck to you. I'm going to choose this one. Right? Uh, it's a terrific, uh, a terrific sentence. Um, but again, uh, this is not so dissimilar to the choice that Moses gives. Uh, even if put in different terms, right? Life or death, serve or don't serve is, is the same choice in, in effect. Uh, to Joshua, the people affirm their choice, right? We too will serve the Lord. And he says, really? No, we will, I promise. Really? No, we will serve none but the Lord. Right? That three times repetition of the people saying, we will obey, the, we will obey, we will obey, we will obey. Exactly the same thing that happened with Moses back in Exodus. Joshua makes a formal covenant with the people, including writing it down and setting up a stone, right? which again is awfully similar to what Moses does back in Exodus. And Joshua, when he dies, is 110 years old, just a bit shy of Moses' perfect age of 120. So uh, we should be clear that Joshua is a second Moses. Is a second Moses. Uh, Joshua completes what Moses had begun. Remember that the leaving of Egypt, right? Moses' task of getting the people from Egypt to the border of the promised land was only part one of the plan that God announced all the way back at the beginning of Moses' life. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and bring them out of that land. That's Moses to a good and spacious land, that's Joshua. You may have noticed in your reading of Joshua that there are a number of episodes in the book that represent the completion of unfulfilled business from the stories we read in the Pentateuch. I don't mean the fulfillment of instructions from Deuteronomy like when Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy says, build an altar on Mount Abal, and then Joshua does it. I mean stories from earlier than that. And I also don't mean the fulfillment of the promise of occupying the land, uh, though that counts too, right? We get that moment in Joshua. Remember I said, right, the, the, the promise to the patriarchs is twofold, progeny and land, and progeny is fulfilled at the end of the book of Genesis, where it says the people were fruitful and multiplied very much. And the other half is getting the land, and we get that here. The Lord gave to Israel the whole country which he had sworn to their fathers that he would assign to them. They took possession of it and settled in it. Right. And of course, the last line there, everything was fulfilled. It's a fairly clear announcement of the, of the uh, fulfillment of that promise. But leaving those, uh, that major part aside, uh, lingering bits from the Pentateuch that have, uh, that find their completion here. Right in Joshua 1, Joshua reminds the Reubenites and the Gadites and the Manassites of their obligation. Right? Remember, you may not remember, uh, I'll remind you, uh, back, in, uh, back in the book of Numbers, in Numbers 32, uh, the Reubenites and Gadites and Manassites are like, hey, how about instead of crossing the Jordan, we just hang out here uh, in this Transjordanian territory we just conquered. And Moses says to them, first you have to help everybody conquer the land, then you can come back and settle here. Okay, might have forgotten about that, but Joshua didn't, right? Remember when Moses said, right, you all have to come fight, right? Uh, so this is, of course, again, directly out of Numbers 32, fulfillment, uh, completion of a, a story that in Numbers anticipated the conquest, and then we had a whole book of Deuteronomy and everyone forgot about it. Uh, the conclusion of the manna episode fits into this as well, right? Uh, since we heard about the manna starting, when did the manna stop? 
I would imagine that most people, when they think about the manna, don't ask that question, <laughs> right? Like, when did they stop having stuff, weird, flaky stuff, fall from the sky? Uh, and, but the text gives us the answer. This is the, the conclusion of a, uh, you know, something that was begun uh, back at the beginning uh, of the Exodus itself. In Joshua 14, Caleb, whom we have heard nothing about for quite some time, not since the spies episode in Numbers 14, Caleb reminds Joshua that he had been uniquely loyal back in that episode of the spies and asks directly for the land that was promised to him back then. Right? Moses told me, right, the land that I spied out, I can have because I was loyal. And here is that, uh, here is, uh, that line from God. And this is exactly what happened, right? Joshua blesses Caleb and gives him Hebron, which is exactly the territory that, that Caleb had spied out back in Numbers. In Joshua 17, the daughters of Tzolofachad. Did you know that that was pronounced Tzolofachad? Now you do. The daughters of Tzolofachad come before Joshua to raise their case, right? The Lord commanded Moses, these are, uh, right, this is uh, going back, of course, to Numbers 27, where God had uh, said, yeah, yeah, these, uh, the daughters of Tzolofachad have a perfectly good case, and they should be assigned territory. And they come, they didn't forget, right? Even if we forgot about them, they didn't forget about themselves. And in Joshua 22, finally, the conquest having come to its end, Joshua gathers the Reubenites and the uh, Gadites and the Manassites and says, you did it. Good, mission accomplished. Now you can go back to your homes in the Transjordan, right? The place that was assigned to you. And the final uh, Pentateuchal reference may be among the most Im important. Uh, the beginning of the Israelite settlement in Egypt, that is the descent of Joseph, the beginning of the Exodus, is the departure from Egypt, and the entry into the promised land with, jo with Joshua are all linked through this little three-verse thread of the bones of Joseph. That again, you know, in Genesis 50, Joseph says, take my bones up from here when you go, and who remembered that? Well, Moses remembered it. And who then remembered that for the entire time in the wilderness, Moses was carrying around the bones of Joseph? And I guess gave them to Joshua. <laughs> but the text remembers. And with this, right, with the burial of the bones of Joseph back in the land that he left so long ago, textually so long ago and chronologically, uh, the conquest and the settlement of the land and the exodus are all concluded. So what do we make of the, these extensions of these Pentateuchal stories into the book of Joshua? Well, they, they speak at least to an issue we pr uh, discussed uh, previously, which is that the sources of the Pentateuch did not and could not end in Deuteronomy. Right? They must have continued because they all contained this kind of unfinished business. Right? And obviously among those is the promise of the land, right? the thing that's promised in all of the sources and not fulfilled in any of them by the time we get to the end of the Pentateuch. But as you can see, there's plenty of other stuff th uh, that belongs in that category also, right? stuff that we didn't notice was unfinished until we saw it finished in the book of Joshua. All of which suggests uh, that, uh, again, these Pentateuchal sources, uh, in their independent existences at least, uh, continued on past the death of Moses and wrapped up their various loose ends, if not more, um, in, in material that was then picked up in the history. Okay, having said all of this stuff about uh, loose ends from Pentateuch and previous sources, there is lots of stuff in the book of Joshua uh, that is what we would call Deuteronomistic, right? The places where we see the historian configuring uh, the history to suit his ideological ends. And I, again, don't mean all the places where instructions from Deuteronomy are carried out and fulfilled. Right, right from the beginning, the historian 
frames the entire narrative of Joshua's life with his own uh, concepts, uh, right from the beginning. Uh, Be strong and resolute, for you shall apportion to this people the land that I swore to their fathers to assign to them. Fine. But you must, right, that's fine, right? That's, everybody knows that's Joshua's role. Joshua's role is to be a warrior, to do the conquering. That's the, the sort of the native inherent Joshua story, as it were. But you must be very strong and resolute to observe faithfully all the Torah that my servant Moses enjoined upon you. Now Joshua is responsible not for conquest, but for upholding the law, the covenant, right? Deuteronomy. Do not deviate it from the, to the right or to the left. That's Deuteronomy's language. That you may be successful wherever you go. Now the conquest seemingly is dependent on Joshua's observance of the law. Let not this book of Torah cease from your lips, but recite it day and night. Now we're imagining Joshua reciting the laws of Deuteronomy and the covenant uh, and, uh, and, and all of our Deuteronomic uh, material while he's conquering territory. Right? This is very much the kind of thing that we see over and over again in the Deuteronomistic history. You see, actions and stories that are in, is essentially unrelated to the law of, of D, unrelated to, you know, the question of, of, of centralization or observing uh, or, or idols or any of the, the stuff that D is familiar with, Joshua doesn't need to be uh, reciting the Torah in order to do all the things that he does. And in fact, when we read the Joshua story, the Torah doesn't come up a single time. Right? We don't have any bits of Joshua you know, going into Jericho and reciting the Torah to the inhabitants until they fall over or something. Right? Like That's not what's happening. But the historian frames the story for us at the beginning. This is what it means. Right? And even picks up on what looks like, in this, uh, in, in this text you can see, right? Uh, be strong and resolute for you shall apportion. Right? That's about his military prowess. That's like the, the original Joshua story text. And then the historian is like, I don't know, I'm going to take those same words, be strong and resolute, and turn them into something slightly different. What I mean is also Torah. Right? That's the way the historian does this. We have the same thing come back at the end of Joshua's life. Right? This is Joshua now speaking to Israel, and then they have to be resolute. Not to conquer, that's done, but to observe faithfully all that's written in the book of the Torah of Moses without ever deviating it from the right and to the left. And now that Joshua is done, without intermingling with these nations that are left among you. Right? This is all what we call, right? this is all language that should be familiar to us. It looks like Deuteronomy, but it's not in Deuteronomy. It's not Deuteronomic, it's Deuteronomistic. Right? But it is, again, uh, it is, again, putting out there the notion that the ideology of Deuteronomy is the guiding principle uh, through which all of the history of Israel is framed. And at the end of this, the, at the end of Joshua's speech, the basic historical concept from Deuteronomy, from D, is stated fairly plainly, right? Just as, all, just as God did good things for you, so God can do bad things for you. If you break the covenant that your God enjoined upon you, and what does that really entail? Serving other gods and bowing down to them, right? Then you will perish from this land. This is D's, Deuteronomy's language put in Joshua's mouth in a way that has nothing to do with Joshua's actual role, which is military leader. You see the historian framing his sources, shaping them, orienting them, incorporating them into this larger historical scheme right from the beginning. And I said last time, nothing really bad happens in Joshua, nothing really, really bad. But Joshua, like Moses, knows that as soon as Joshua is gone from the scene, right, that's when stuff is going to start to slide. And so the same warnings uh, about obedience and reward and disobedience and punishment. Now, uh, a brief word about the historicity of Joshua. Uh, and uh, brief because uh, if you've been reading your Collins textbook, you've read all about this, and I don't really want to repeat too much here. Uh, but uh, a quick reminder, the archaeological evidence shows us that the conquest as portrayed in the book of Joshua never happened, which honestly, at this point, what's new? Um, and frankly, right, this, this shouldn't be a surprise since 
So, uh, you know, once we said that the exodus didn't really happen, the entire notion of Israel coming into Canaan from outside, uh, sort of en masse at least, uh, seems patently fictional, which basically puts to rest uh, what we call the conquest model, which is to say uh, uh, was really never much of a model at all. It was just the biblical story. Right? That was not, that's not a model, that's just the Bible. Um, really, this model was an attempt to prove the biblical story to be historically accurate. Uh, after the conquest model was put to rest, uh, we uh, came up with something called the peaceful infiltration model. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, this, this notion is, again, uh, that the Israelites were nomads they were nomads who organized themselves into a 12-tribe league, as nomads are wont to do. Uh, they organized them into a 12-tribe league, which uh, was understood on the model of similar 12-tribe uh, or 12-city-state leagues in Greece, uh, which in Greece were called in amphictyony. You don't need to write it down. I didn't put it on the board because I never need to ask you about it again. Uh, but an Amphictyony was this 12-tribe league uh, in Greece. And some scholars were like, and what if that's what happened here too? It was, these were like little nomadic tribes and they organized themselves. And that's where Israel came from. Uh, but it turns out we've learned since then that the sort of implied division between nomads and sedentary people in the ancient uh, world is not a real one. Uh, and the whole Amphictyony thing fell apart just about, uh, I mean, within like 20 years after it was raised, people still talk about it, it was crazy, but like it, it like fell very hard because people realized there was no evidence for it. Um, and speaking of lack of evidence, uh, there was then the peasant revolt model, uh, which was really a product of its time more than I think almost any model we've had. Uh, the time that the peasant revolt model arose was the 60s and the 70s. Um, the giveaway uh, for this being a product of this time uh, probably should have been uh, the dedication of one of the, the major works, like making the argument uh, for this model, was dedicated to the children of Vietnam, which, you know, again, uh, it, you know, gives us a, a setting of, uh, it, was, it was a fairly openly um, Marxist reading. Uh, the problem, uh, as I suggested, of this model, the peasant revolt model, uh, was that, you know, and, and again, that this model was, was that uh, Israel uh, took over uh, in Canaan uh, by, you know, the peasants revolting against the Canaanite city-states. Uh, the problem here was that this one was absolutely, unequivocally, totally uh, lacking in anything remotely resembling evidence. Uh, so now what we have uh, and what we're left with is something called the gradual emergence model which just by its name feels like probably has more likelihood of being right. Gradual, I don't know, you know, like, uh, basically uh, new archeological evidence has come into play and I feel a little bit uncomfortable saying this because, uh, you know, Irene, uh, one of your TFs is an archeologist and probably is going to like yell at me if I get anything wrong um, and stuff may be out of date. In any case, uh, here, here's my go at it. Uh, in the Bronze Age, uh, which is to say approximately pre-1200 BCE, uh, Canaanite, culture, Canaanite culture was centered in a handful of major cities along the coast. Uh, at the turn of the Iron Age, however, again around 1200, uh, a, a number of smaller settlements gradually arose in the highlands of Canaan, that is the area around Jerusalem, the hills of Ephraim and, um, and Benjamin, uh, over, you know, around where Jerusalem is. Uh, these settlements uh, were made possible uh, in part because of uh, technological advancements like uh, cisterns and terracing of, wall of the hillsides, which allowed them to, you know, settle on hills and grow things there. Uh, is it pouring rain outside? It is. Are you serious? How do you all know that? <laughs> what are you all, meteorologists in here? It, I, I, ten, okay. Um, sorry, it was very loud for a second. Uh, so we have major Canaanite city-states. Suddenly, we, we have, in the archaeological evidence, we have uh, these smaller settlements dotting the hillsides uh, in around uh, the 12th century, uh, 1200 BCE. Uh, 
Uh, that happens to be, those hillsides happen to be just where Israelite tradition itself places early Israel. This is where the stories of the judges mostly take place, for example. Uh, and the material culture of these early settlements in these hills is continuous, it seems, uh, on into later, more advanced settlements um, in the era of the Israelite monarchy, which itself was, of course, centered on those very hills. That's where Jerusalem is, as I said. The theory, then, is that Israel emerged from Canaanite society, right? that these settlements in the hills were people who were sort of migrating from the Canaanite uh, major city centers up into the hillsides for a variety of reasons uh, we can speculate about. Some of them have to do with uh, external pressure from, say, the Philistines, who showed up at exactly this time on exactly the same coast as the Canaanites. Uh, could be uh, in combination with the Philistines, uh, not to be too modern about it, but you know something along the lines of climate change. Uh, you know, uh, we there's real, relatively good evidence that there was some climactic shift at this time. This is a, approximately when uh, we talk about the late Bronze Age collapse. This is when essentially most major civilizations in the uh, Levant and Mediterranean kind of all collapsed, um, uh, which caused things like the migrations of the Philistines, but also may have caused uh, you know, unrest in cities that led people to, to flee them into the, the previously unsettled hill country. Uh, having then isolated themselves geographically, these early Israelites uh, would have developed uh, religiously and culturally distinctive practices, some of them just by virtue of separation, and some of them with the intent of separating, right? We're going to do this because we want to distinguish ourselves from our neighbors, uh, which is not, in any case, a particularly romantic uh, or beautiful explanation for uh, how Israel came to be in the place it came to be. Uh, it's certainly not as romantic as, say, we swept in and conquered everyone. Uh, but it is, I think, the closest uh, that thing that we have for the moment and at least has the uh, benefit of having some archaeological evidence behind it. <laughs> 